Okay, shalom everyone and welcome to another uh, Science and Spirituality study. And tonight's study is really fascinating. I thought it was fascinating. And uh, it's titled, Cosmic X-rays Reveal a Distinct a distinctive signature of black hole event horizons. And then we'll look at a, a spiritual insight. You know, we'll draw out that spiritual insight, see what, what the Lord can speak to us from this stuff. And um, recently, what was interesting in, in the science news is that astrophysicists have discovered what, what they call a distinct signature of black hole event horizons, which differentiates the object in space that they're looking at from a neutron star. Okay, so I, I also, doing this study, also learned a little bit more about neutron stars, which is neutron stars, they're actually comparable to black holes in mass and size, but they're confined by a hard surface. That was something I didn't know about until, you know, writing the study. And the researchers that worked in the, the, the published work that they, uh, they had done, they, they they are a, a team of international researchers. And they were from uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research from India. It's one. The Max Planck Institute of Astrophysics in Germany. And, and famous, right? And the, the Space Research Institute of Russia, Academy of Sciences in Russia. And so the, these were an international team and, and they published a paper that was accepted in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And it's a 2020 paper. And uh, it, it was titled, the, the title of the paper was Cosmic X-rays Reveal a Distinctive Signature of Black Hole Event Horizons. And so when looking out into space, and since it's a, such a great distance away, a black hole, um, it's hard to differentiate, right? It's hard to understand what, what a black, whether, whether an object in space is a black hole or not. And the black holes... They are a region of space where the gravitational field is so intense that neither matter or radiation can escape. I mean, we've all heard that, right? And the black hole is called an exotic cosmic object that does not have a hard surface as compared to the neutron star. And the, the scientists claim that the neutron star has a hard surface. You know, Einstein predicted what the surface of a black hole would be like according to his theory of general relativity. And the surface of a black hole also is also called the event horizon, you know, the location at which there is no return. You know, when, when you pass that point as getting closer to the black hole, then uh, there is no return, no matter, no radiation, no light, nothing can escape. It, it's, that's it, that's the end. And to date, there is only one black hole that has actually been imaged which has a mass that they estimate to be more than six billion times as the mass of the sun. So it's huge. In the research paper, the scientists measured what they call the Compton, Compton scattering and electron temperature of objects in space, where they were believed to be possible candidates for black holes. Now, the Compton scattering it was discovered by this this man named Arthur Hawley Compton. It was named after him. And it is the scattering of a photon by a charged particle, usually an electron. And it, it's, inter it's if, if the, um, the scattering results in a decrease in energy, meaning that there is an increase in wavelength of the photon, which may be an X-ray or a gamma ray photon, you know, it is called Compton effect. You know, and part of the energy of the photon is transferred to the recoiling electron. In inverse, the inverse Compton scattering occurs when the charged particle transfers part of its energy to the photon, so you get a, a narrowing and of the wavelength. And by the early 20th century, research into the interaction of X-rays with matter was well underway. And it was observed that when X-rays of a known wavelength interacted with atoms, the X-rays were scattered through a angle theta, and they emerged at different wavelength related to theta. You know, although classical electromagnetism predicted that the wavelength of scattered rays could, should be equal to the initial wavelength, multiple experiments have found that the wavelength of the scattered ray was much longer, okay? And so corresponding to the, the, the lower energy level. And then the initial wavelength, you know, as compared to the initial wavelength. Now, 1923, right, 1923, long, almost 100 years ago, 
you know, Compton published a paper in the Journal of Physical Review. I cited that paper, and you can see there in the references. Let me scroll up here. It is. It was published in Physical Review Journal. It is 1923 and volume 22, number five. And uh, I linked the PDF, so you can go straight to the PDF. You can read that. You know, the, something that the researcher wrote almost 100 years ago. You know, it's, it's 1923. Right now, it's 2020, right? And anyway, so he, he published his paper in Physical Review Journal, and that explained the X-ray shift by attributing particle-like momentum to light quanta, okay? Einstein, as we remember, has proposed light quanta in 1905, you know, well over 100 years ago, in explaining the photoelectric effect. Right, you know, where a, a photon would come down and hit like a, a metal oxide surface and bump off a an electron, and you can you can use that electron like on solar panels, you know, solar cells. But um, Einstein proposed this, but I, I read that Compton did not build on Einstein's work. This is something he discovered on his own, and the the energy of light quanta depends only on the frequency of the light, and we know that different colors have different frequencies, right? And in this paper, in Compton's paper in 1923, he derived the mathematical relationship between the shift in wavelength and the scattering angle of the X-rays by assuming that each scattered X-ray photon interacted with only one electron. He made an assumption in order to get an analytical solution, you know, probably. But um, the research paper describes, in this research paper in, in 2020, in the, uh, what was that, what was that journal again? It was called uh, the Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Okay, the, the paper that they published describes how the researchers measured these two source properties. You know, they, used, they measured the electron temperature and then the optimization parameter from X-ray data that is taken from many black hole neutron star, star candidates. And so they had, they had this uh, large database of x-ray data that they they worked on in order to sort this stuff out and the graph when they graph the data then when they graph the quantization parameter on the y-axis and the electron temperature on the x-axis it revealed a very clear distinction between two sets of objects you know the the they believe with the black holes versus the the neutron star and the neutron star it's the densest object in the universe that has a hard surface. It was interesting. That was neat. And the neutron stars, they, they also produce X-rays by accreting matter from a companion star in a similar manner in which that black holes do. And so this is why the researchers needed to distinguish the neutron stars from the black hole to see which was which, you know, what, what kind of object or exotic object this was in outer space. And they seem to have been able to do that. And they, with this X-ray data, they use an archival X-ray data from decommissioned astronomy satellite uh, Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer that they have identified the effect of the lack of hard surface on the observed X-ray emissions from these objects. And then subsequently found an extremely strong signature of accreting stellar mass black holes. And so I thought really, really interesting research of what they're doing in the astrophysics, you know, area and um, it's fascinating work and how they, 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 they tie in all of these concepts from, you know, a hundred years ago, right? And this is fascinating. And so the spiritual insights that we receive from this type of research is paralleled to this distinct signature that was discovered allowing us to distinguish between black holes and neutron stars. You know, this draws out how the God of Israel gives us a distinction for the purpose of the world, uh, knowing who we are by the way that we live and by the way that we love one another. You know, and according to the Torah, when we look in Parashat Lech Lecha, we can find that God called Abraham from his people to become a great nation. So if we, we turn to the Torah, we can see here in Parashat Lech Lecha that uh, the Lord, he, he spoke unto Abraham, Avram, Avram was his name at this time, his name hadn't been changed yet. And he says, get up and go from your, your land. Okay, from, um, from your land. And it says, from 
your people, right, in, from your country. And it says, and from the house of your father unto, unto the land that I will show you, right? And he, the Lord goes on and he says that, and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those that bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And then all, and then he says on all the families, all, let's see, where was I at? And it says, um, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Okay. And then in verse four, it says, so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions, which they had accumulated in the persons which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. And thus they came, came to the land of Canaan. And so um, looking at this set of scriptures right here. And what is interesting here is in how the covenant it is the covenant that, that God is making with Abraham. You know, the Lord repeated this covenant promise to three generations, you know, to Abraham in, in right here in Genesis 12, and to Isaac in Genesis 21 and chapter 26, and to Jacob in Genesis 28. You know, the covenant promised them land, many descendants, and a blessing from God. And here, the Lord called Abram, to leave the land of Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. And it is here in Genesis 12 that we see the Lord establishing a covenant with him. The way in which the Lord revealed himself to Abraham distinguishes himself. The Lord God, the way he is speaking to Abraham is distinguishing himself between as the creator, you know, and as the God of Abraham and as the God of Isaac and as the God of Jacob. You know, he's showing God's desire for a relationship with his people, you know, being distinctly different from the gods of Egypt and of this world, right? The, the promise of land, that which is in Canaan, was meant to remind the people of the covenant that God had made. You know, the existence of Israel today is a testimony of this covenant and this promise of God. When, he, when we note the existence of Israel, we note how the pages of Scripture reveals to us the plan of God for the ages, right? And the God of Abraham, the Isaac, and Jacob is merciful, right? The Torah speaks of his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, right? His kindness and his, and his long-suffering and his love for us. And he seeks each one of us to come to him by faith. You know, when, when Abraham rose, he packed up all that he had. He proceeded in life. Pro, he proceeded in life by faith. You know, this is a testimony to us. You know, the relationship and a distinction that God gives to us is revealed in the Lord himself calling himself the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, um, the Lord says this in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. So let's, let's go down through, let's go down to Exodus 3, 15. Let's see here. Give me a second. I'll find it. Okay, I went a little far. Uh, oh, right here. Right at the end. Almost there. Okay, here's Exodus. And then chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 3. Right here. And then 3.15, specifically, it's on the next page. Okay, so Moshe was instructed to identify the God of Israel, right, as the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And we see right here that, um, right here in, on verse 15, let me underline it. And it says, uh, I'll read through here, and it says that, and, and the Lord said unto Moshe, he says that, that he is to say unto the children of Israel, you know, Tomar el Bene Israel, you know, that the, 
Adonai Elohe, you're right, Adonai the Lord, your God is the God of your fathers, right? And he says that then then this is this is the important point right here. He says that it is um, he is Elohe Avraham, Elohe Yitzhak, the Elohe Yaakov. Okay, and so what's what's interesting here is in how I'm connecting this to the scientific research is in the sense that the the way that the scientists were able to to understand this distinct signature to differentiate between these two objects that look very similar, right? And here in the scriptures, the Lord is revealing himself in a specific way, and he is identifying himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And this is how Moshe was instructed to identify him to his people, to Israel. You know, and we read in Exodus 3, verses 6 to 8, we read the following, and it says that he said, also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, If I, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in, e in Egypt, and have given heed to their cry, because they're taskmasters, for I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey and to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. And so here the Lord identifies himself as having compassion and coming to deliver his people. You know, the Lord reveals to Moshe that he is the covenant God, right? Who is with his people. You know, he's here for us, right? But not just that he is present and hears their cry of bondage. The Lord wants his people to know that he is with them. As he said in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, that he will deliver them from Egypt from bondage and set them free. You know, as he said in Exodus 3, verse 8. And that he is fulfilling his covenant promises that he made to Israel, you know, to to their fathers, you know, through Moshe. So the intermediary, the intermediary, right? The the um, he was a Mashiach type. He was a, a Messiah type, right? And Moshe is also reassured that God is powerful and all sufficient to protect him too. You know, the, the Lord reveals himself to Moshe at the burning bush as the self-existing God who needs nothing to be who he is and to do what he purposes. You know, the idea of God revealing himself in the burning bush speaks to the sufficiency of God's power and ability to do what he proclaimed he was going to do. You know, the bush never burned. It, I mean, it never consumed the fuel you know when when a fire is set it's usually consuming something right consuming it up but this bush burned and burned and burned and it never burned up you know because it was the presence of god there and this distinction that we find here in exodus 3 speaks to what the scientific research is drawing out for us you remember how the scientific research uh recently published speaks of this distinct signature that was discovered allowing us to differentiate between black holes and neutron stars you know in parallel fashion god revealed to us something about himself that as self-existing and all sufficient these things are critical to grasp as no other god had proclaimed this and recognized or performed such great miracles on behalf of you know, as we see here, is God, the God of Israel, doing on his, to his people. You know, these things reveal to us the purpose of God by revealing himself to us in this particular way, which was to make a distinction in himself who he is and to make a distinction in us who we are as his people. You know, that was the purpose of giving us his Torah. Now, in the creation account, we're told how the, the, that God spoke Adam into his form as according to the scriptures in Genesis 1 verse 26. So um, we go up to Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Let's see here. Right here's the scriptures. Okay. So 
And these scriptures say, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, the sky and over the cattle and over all of the earth and over every weeping, creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And the scriptures speak to God making man in the image and the likeness of God. You know, because of this, we can expect a very strong correlation between the spoken word and reality. Right? The Lord God is able to literally create reality by his words. Right? He, he created all things. According to the creation account, it says that, um, it says here, Voyomer Elohim Yehior and Yehior. It says, and, and the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light. Right, he in in God literally is able to create reality with His Word. You know, when He created us, we're only able to create words and to interpret words and to make decisions and assessments based upon our words. Right, and the Lord revealed His character by His love and deeds through the Jewish people. And just as we see here in the life of Moshe from Exodus, you know, this is the very same thing. You know, Paul wrote in Philippians two. He said that Yeshua, being made unique as the Son of God, took on the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of man, and became the sin-bearer, right, of the world, and, and laid his life down on the cross on our behalf. You know, Paul said, he said, therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that the name of Yeshua every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Yeshua, the Messiah, is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, the way the Lord God revealed himself to Moshe, according to Exodus chapter 3, coupled to the way that we were created in the likeness of God, we are given the responsibility to properly confess and believe the truth. You know, this draws us back to how God revealed himself to Moshe in preparing for the bringing out of his people from Egypt. You know, he called himself the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You know, in Exodus 3.15. You know, he instructed Moshe to identify the Lord by that name when speaking to the Israelites. He said that in verse six, 316, right, and in Exodus. And this carries the important implication that he is distinguishing himself from the gods of Egypt and of the world. You know, the, the Lord calling himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob implies the promise of land and of freedom and of blessing. You know, these are the things that God promises us to. And it's the reason why we fight so hard to keep them. Right? The Lord made promises and he is faithful to those promises in bringing us to our inheritance. And just as he has done and continues to do for Israel. You know, this, this name draws us back to the covenant God that, had, that he had made with Abraham and teaches us about the power of God in the lives of his people. You know, Yeshua used this section of scripture from Exodus 3 to speak to the Sadducees about the resurrection in Matthew 22. You know, he pointed out the, wor the verb am is in the present tense and that God did not say that he was the God of their fathers. You know, the difference is huge. You know, as Yeshua showed how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive, right? And the scientific research draws out this, this idea of who God is, right? By, by discussing this unique signature that allows us to distinguish between these two exotic objects in space, you know, black holes or neutron stars. You know, and in parallel fashion, the Almighty God revealed himself in a very unique way by the deliverance of his people by the hand of Moshe. And he also revealed himself through the prophets by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know, the New Testament speaks of God revealing himself through his son, Yeshua. And the scriptures make it very clear the importance of truth in believing in the truth. In the name of God and his son, Yeshua, is so vital to our correct understanding of the truth that without him and his name, we are all lost. You know, this is the reason why we are told explicitly that there is salvation in no other name in Acts 4, verse 12. And this is why Paul said what he did in Romans 10, you know, with the mouth that we confess and with the heart that we believe. 
you know, we confess, confession is of the lips, right? And they are made unto, confession is made unto salvation. The heart is made for faith, right? And the choice lies with each of us, whether we believe the testimony of Moshe on who God is. You know, we see right here in the Torah, right, even with, in the beginning, you know, Bereshit, Bara Elohim, in the beginning God created. You know, do we believe this testimony of God? Do we believe who he is? Do we believe that he come because he loves us, right? And he wants each of us to believe in him. You know, do we believe that? This is a distinction that the scientific research is drawing out for us. You know, we, we have the responsibility of, as God's people to speak forth the truth of God's salvation and to bring it into our hearts and to live it out every day of our lives. You know, the Lord God of Israel is personally revealed, he has personally revealed himself to us through history, you know, through the pages of scripture right here in, in the Torah and throughout all of scripture, right? And the history, right? The history of, of the, the Jewish people and the, the word of God literally has been preserved for us throughout the centuries and is preserved for us as a testimony to the truth. You know, speaking for the truth of God's graciousness to come down and dwell in our midst. You know, having faith in these things, believing in God our Father in heaven and in his son Yeshua, who gave his life for us. And when we believe with genuine kavana, right? With gen genuine kavana and reverence that we enter into, we, are, we, are, we enter into a relationship with him. You know, we, we can have a relationship with him. You know, we are asking the Lord to come into our lives, to be a part of our lives. You know, and and this this distinction, this uniqueness of who God is and how He revealed Himself to us is fascinating parallel to the scientific research, don't you think? You know, so that's what I have for the study for tonight. And if you enjoyed the study, give me a thumbs up. And uh, if you want to talk about it, send me an email. You can find my email at matsadi.com website. And uh, thanks for listening. Bye.